Book One, Chapters Three and Four of Amadis of Gaul. Book One, Chapter Three. How King Perdion went to his own country, and of what befell him, and how Udiganda met Don Gandales, and of that which she said to him. King Perdion, having departed from Elima, went his way in great heaviness, as well as for the loneliness wherein he had left Elisena, whom in his heart he loved, as also for the dream which in such a season had come upon him. But having reached his own country, he sent for all his great lords, and ordered the bishops to bring with them the most learned clerks in their parts, to the end they might expound his dream. When his vassals knew of his return, many others, as well as all who were summoned, came with great desire to see him who was beloved of all. The king conferred with them on the state of the realm, but it was always with a sad countenance, whereby they were much afflicted. And this business being dispatched, he dismissed them each to his own lands, only staying with him three clerks, whom he knew were the most skilful in what he desired to learn. These men he took into his chapel, and thereupon his sacred host he made them swear to answer truly what he should demand, without fear, how dangerous soever it were. That done they left the chapel, and he told them his dream. Then one of them, whose name was Ongar the Picard, the most expert of them, thus answered, Dream, sire, are vain things, and for such ought to be esteemed. Notwithstanding, seeing it is your pleasure that some account should be made of yours, give us time to consider thereon. Let it be so, said the king. Take twelve days, and he ordered them to be separated, that they should neither see nor converse with each other. They to their uttermost travailed upon this matter, and when the time was elapsed, they went to the king. He first took Alberto of Champagne apart, and said to him, You know what you have sworn, now then speak to me. Sire, answered Alberto, then let the rest be called into your presence, for before them will I tell you. Whereupon they were sent for, and being all met, Alberto began. It appears to me that the closed chamber, and he whom you saw enter by the secret door, signify this realm, which is close and well guarded. Nevertheless, some one shall enter to take it from you, and like as he thrust his hand into your side, and rent forth your heart, and threw it into the river, even so shall town or castle be taken from you, and put into his hand from whom you shall not easily recover them. In the other heart, quoth the king, which he said should remain with me, and yet he must take it away against his will? It seemeth by this, answered Alberto, that some other shall invade your country, as the first did, yet constrained more by another commanding him to do so, than by any will in himself. And upon this, sire, I know nothing more to say. The king then commanded Antilles to say what he had discovered. He agreed to all that the other had said, except in this, quoth he, that my art shows me it is already done, and by the person that most loveth thee. This makes me marvel, for nothing of your kingdom is yet lost, and if it were, it could not be by one who loves you so dearly. Hearing this, the king smiled a little, for it seemed he had said something. But Ungan the Picard, who knew much more than they, held down his head and laughed heartily, a thing which he had seldom done, being by nature a thoughtful and melancholy man. The king wondered at this, and said, Now, master, tell us what you know. Sire, said he, peradventure I have seen into things which should be manifested to you alone, therefore let these depart. Then the doors were closed, and they twain remained together. No, king, said he, that what I laughed at was a word of which you thought little. When he said it was already done, and by the person whom best loveth ye, now shall I reveal what you keep closely concealed, and think that none knows. Your love, where you have already accomplished your will, and she whom you love is marvellously fair. Then told he all the fashions of her, as if she were there before him. The chamber in which you saw yourself enclosed, you well know, and how she to ease your heart in her own entered without your knowledge by the secret door, and the hand that opened your side is your union, and the heart which was taken out showeth that she hath by you a son or a daughter. Master, said the king, what meaneth then the casting thereof into the river? He replied, Seek not to know that which is of no importance. Tell me how be it, quoth Perdion, and fear nothing. Since you are pleased to hear it, answered Ungan, I demand assurance that for anything which I may reveal, you will never hereafter be wroth with her who loveth you so loyally. And Perdion made the promise. Know then, said the master, 
that what you saw cast into the river is the child which he has had by you and that other heart that remaineth what should that be you may interpret the one by the other answered ungan you will have another son who will in some manner be taken away against the will of her that caused the loss of the first strange things hast thou told me said perdion and may it please god that the latter part the misfortunes of my children prove not as true as what thou hast told me concerning the lady whom i love the master answered none can alter the things which were ordained by god nor know wherein they shall end and therefore should neither repine nor rejoice thereat for oftentimes as well the evil as the good proves far otherwise than it seemed and do thou o king lay aside from thy memory all this which thou wast so solicitous to know and pray to god to dispose these things to his holy service the king was satisfied in what he desired and so pleased with the wisdom and the last words of ungan the picard that he rewarded him well and kept him thenceforward near his person as perdion parted from the clerks he met a damsel more ornamented than beautiful who said to him now king perdion that when thou recoverest thy loss the kingdom of ireland shall lose its flower and away she went so that he could not detain her and he remained thinking upon these things the author ceaseth to speak of this and returneth to the child whom gandales brought up he was named the child of the sea for so they had named him and with much care was he brought up by that good knight and his wife and he grew and became so fair that all who saw him marvelled one day gandales rode forth for he was a right good knight and strong and always accompanied king languines at such time as they followed arms and though the king had ceased to follow them yet gandales ceased not he as he rode along met a damsel that thus spake to him ah gandales if many great personages knew what i know they would cut off thy head wherefore quoth he she replied because thou nourishedest their death now this was the damsel who had prophesied to king perdion but gandales understood not and he said damsel i beseech ye for god's sake what is this i shall not tell thee she answered but so it must be and she went her way he remained thoughtful but soon he saw her returning upon her palfrey with all speed and crying with a loud voice gandales help me or i am dead he looked and saw a knight come after her sword in hand and he spurred his horse between them and cried out sir knight god confound thee what wouldst thou with that damsel what said the other wouldst thou protect her who by her art has made me lose body and soul of that i know nothing said gandales but protect her i will for women are not to be thus punished even though they deserve it the knight answered that we shall see and returning his sword into the scabbard he rode to a little thicket wherein there waited a damsel exceedingly fair who gave him a shield and a lance and then he ran at gandales and gandales at him they had not long fought before she who had desired succour of gandales stepped between them and cried hold forthwith the knight who had pursued her drew back and she said to him come make obeisance to me that shall i do willingly said he as to the thing in the world which i most love and throwing the shield from his neck and the sword from his hand he bent his knees before her to the wonder of gandales then she bade him tell the damsel under the trees to get her away immediately or he would take her head off he turned to her and exclaimed thou ill woman i know not why i spare thee and the damsel saw that her friend was enchanted wherefore she mounted her palfrey and rode away making great sorrow the other damsel then said gandales i thank you for what you have done go and good be with you as for this night i pardon him that said gandales you may but i shall not give over the battle unless he confess himself vanquished she answered give it over for though you were the best knight in the world i could make him vanquish you then tell me said he the meaning of what you said that i nourished the death of many great personages she made him swear that none should know it from him till she permitted and then said i tell thee he whom thou foundest in the sea shall be the flower of knighthood in his time he shall cause the strongest to stoop he shall enterprise and finish with honour that wherein others have failed and such deeds shall he do as none would think could be begun nor ended by body of man he shall humble the proud and cruel of heart shall he be against those who deserve it and he shall be the knight in the world 
who most loyally maintains love and he shall love one answerable to his high prowess and i tell you that on both sides he is of kingly parentage now go thy way and believe that all this shall come to pass and if thou discoverest it there shall happen to thee therefore more evil than good ah lady said gandales tell me for god's sake where i can find you to talk with you upon this child's affairs she answered that shalt thou never know tell me then your name i beseech you by the faith you owe to the thing in the world that you love best thou conjurest me so that i will tell but the thing that i love best is that which least loves me and it is that fair knight which whom you combated howbeit i cease not for that to bring him to my will whatever he can do my name is Utaganda, the unknown mark me well and know me again if you can and he who first saw her a damsel in her springtime as one of eighteen years now beheld her so old and overspent that he marvelled how she could sit upon her horse and he crossed himself she took a perfume box from her bosom and touching it became as she was before now said she think you to find me hereafter though you should seek me weary not yourself for that for though all living creatures go about it if i list they should lose their labour as god shall save me i believe it lady but i pray you remember the child who was forsaken of all but myself doubt not that said Udiganda. i love him more than thou canst think for i shall soon receive aid from him twice which none else could give me and he shall receive two gardens to his joy now god be with thee thou shalt see me sooner than thou expectest and then she took the shield and helmet of her friend to carry them and gandales seeing his head disarmed thought him the goodliest knight that he ever beheld and so they parted as gandales returned to his castle he found that other damsel by the way sitting beside a fountain and lamenting she knew him and exclaimed how is it knight that the wicked woman who you helped has not destroyed you wicked she is not said gandales but good and wise and if you were a knight i would make you pay dearly for the folly of your words ah the wretch quoth she how she knows to beguile every one she has taken from me the fair knight who would more willingly be mine but i will be revenged if i can gandales answered it is a wild thought to hope to injure her who knows your very intentions and as for the knight it seems to me that you are both without reason or conscience with that he left her and came to his castle and seeing the little boy come running towards him he took him up in his arms and lovingly embraced him and remembering all that Udiganda had told him he said in his heart my fair child god let me live to see thy good days and with that the tears came at this time the child was of three years and his beauty was marvellous to behold and he seeing the tears put up his little hands to wipe them away whereat gandales rejoiced as a sign that he would be gentle-hearted and thenceforward he taught him with a kinder will and when he came to the age of five he made a bow for him suited to his strength and another for his son gandaline and they used to shoot before him when he was seven years old king languines and his queen and household passing through his kingdom from one town to another came to the castle of gandales where they were well feasted but the child of the sea and gandaline and the other children were removed to the back court that they might not be seen it fortuned that the queen was lodged in one of the highest apartments of the castle and looking from her window she saw the children at play with their bows and among them she remarked the child of the sea for her shapeliness and beauty and he was better clad than his companions of whom he looked like the lord the queen called to her ladies and damsels come and see the fairest creature that ever was seen while they were looking at him the child who was thirsty laid down his bow and arrows and went to a water-pipe to drink a boy bigger than the rest took up his bow to shoot with it this gandaline would not suffer the other struck him angrily and gandaline cried out help me child of the sea he hearing this ran to him and snatched the bow and crying in an ill minute did you strike my brother struck him on the head with all his force they fought a while till the other was fain to run away and meeting their tutor who asked what was the matter replied that the child of the sea had beat him the tutor went towards him with a strap in his hand how is this child of the sea said he that you dare beat the boys i shall punish you but the child fell upon his knees i had rather you would strike me said he than that any one before me should dare to beat my brother and the tears came in his eyes 
the tutor was moved and told him to do so no more all this the queen saw and she wondered why they called him the child of the sea end of chapter three book one chapter four how king Languines took with him amadis who was called the child of the sea and gandalin the son of don gandales at this time the king and gandales entered and the queen asked their host if that fair child was his he answered yes why then said she is he called the child of the sea because he was born on the sea when i returned from brittany truly he is but little like you said the queen and this she said because the child was beautiful to a wonder and gandales was more good than handsome the king who was looking at him likewise bade gandales call him for i will take him with me said he and have him brought up so let it be said gandales but he is not yet of an age that he should leave his mother then he went and brought him and said child of the sea will you go with this king my master wherever you bid me he replied and my brother shall go with me and i quoth gandalin will not stay without him gandalis then looked at the king i believe sire you must take them both i am the better pleased answered the king in calling agrias my son i would have you love these boys as well as i love their father when Gantley saw that the child of the sea was placed in the hands of another, the tears came into his eyes, and he said within himself, Fair son, thou art a little one to begin to go into adventure and danger. And now I see thee in the service of those who may one day serve thee. God guard thee, and fulfill what the wise Udiganda foretold, and let me live to see the great wonders which in arms are promised thee. When the king saw that his eyes were full, he said, I did not think thou had been so foolish. Nor am I, answered Gandales. But if it please you, do you and the queen hear me? The rest then withdrew, and he told them how he had found the child, and he would have told what he knew from Udaganda, but for his promise. And now, said he, deal ye with the child as you ought, for as God shall save me by the way in which he came to me, I believe he is of great lineage. Then the queen said, he should be hers so long as he was of age to obey women and the next morning they departed taking the children with them now i tell you that the queen brought up the child of the sea as carefully as if he had been her own son and the trouble she took with him was not in vain for such was his talent and so noble his nature that better and more quickly than any besides he learned everything and he was so fond of the chase that if they would have let him he would have been always shooting with the bow or training with dogs and the queen loved him so that she would scarce suffer him to be out of her sight now king perdion after consulting the clerks abode in his kingdom and many times he thought upon the words which the damsel had spoken yet could he not understand them after some time he being in his palace there came a damsel and gave him a letter from elisena his love whereby she gave him to know that her father was dead and she was unprotected and for this cause he should pity her, for the Queen of Scotland, her sister, was coming with her husband to take possession of the land. King Perdion, though he was sorrowful, Garanter's death, yet rejoiced to think that he should go for his mistress, whom he never ceased to love. And he said to the damsel, Return, and tell your lady that without delaying a single day I shall speedily be with her. And the damsel returned joyfully king then collecting a suitable retinue set forth and journeyed till he came to the lesser britain where he found news that languines was in mastery of all the land except those towns which her father had left to elisena so hearing that she was at a town called acarte he went there and if he was well received need not be said and she also by him who so dearly loved her the king told her to call together all her friends and kindred for he would take her to wife the which elisena did with great joy for in that consisted the end of all her wishes now when king Languines knew the coming of king perdion and how he would marry elisena he summoned all the noblemen of the land and went with them to meet him and when the marriage and the feast were concluded the kings agreed to return into their own dominions perdion returning with elisena his wife came to a riverside where he would rest the night and while the tents were erecting he rode alone along the banks thinking how he might learn something from elisena about the child of whom ungan the picard had told him 
So long went he on in this mood, till he came to a hermitage, and fastening his horse to a tree, he went in to say his prayers. There was an old man within, in the habit of his order, who asked him, Knight, is it true that King Perdion has married the daughter of our king? Yea, verily, answered the king. Praise be God, said the good hermit, for I know certainly that she loved him with all her heart. How know you that? By her own mouth, said he. The king then, thinking to hear of him the thing he most desired to know, made himself known, and besought the hermit to tell him all he had heard of her. Truly, sir, answered the good man, therein should I greatly fault, and you would hold me for a heretic if I should divulge what was said in confession. Suffice what I tell you, that she loves you with true and loyal love. But I would have you know what a damsel, who seemed very wise, said to me at the time when you came first into this country, and I could not understand her, that from the lesser Britain should come two dragons, who should hold their sway in Gaul, in their hearts in Great Britain, and from hence they should go to devour the beasts of other countries, and against some they should be so fierce and furious, and against others so gracious and mild, as if they had neither talons nor hearts. The king wondered at this, which he could not understand, but there came a time when he knew the prophecy was true, so he returned to his tents. When they were in bed together, he told the queen what had been interpreted of his dream, and asked her if she had brought forth the son. The queen, hearing him, had so great shame that she wished herself dead, and she altogether denied it, so that at this time the king could not learn what he desired. They continued their journey till they arrived in Gaul, and those of the land were well pleased with their queen, who was a most noble lady, and the king had by her a son and a daughter, whom he called Galior and Melicia. When the boy was two years and a half old, it so was that the king his father sojourned at a town called Bengal, which was near the sea. The king was looking from a window towards the gardens, where the queen and her ladies were solacing themselves, and the child with them, who then began to walk. They saw enter through a postern door that went out to the sea a giant with a huge mace in his hand, so large and mismade that never man saw him without a fright. The women ran, some among the trees, and others fell down and shut their eyes that they might not see him. But he went straight to the child who was left alone, and taking him in his arms he laughed and said, The damsel told me true. And with that he went out by the same way, and entering into a bark, put to sea, the queen, who saw him carry away the child, shrieked loudly, but it nothing availed, and her grief was so great that though the king was greatly afflicted for the loss of his son, whom he could not succor, yet, seeing there was no remedy, he went to console Elisena, who was, as it were, destroying herself with excess of grief, remembering the first son that she had exposed upon the sea, and now that she saw this gone also, she made the greatest raving in the world. But Perdion took her with him to their chamber, and when she was somewhat calmed, he said to her, Now I know that what the wise man told me was true, for this was the last heart. So tell me all the truth, for considering the state in which you were, you ought not to be blamed. And then the queen, though with great shame, related to him all, and he comforted her, and bade her live in hope to hear good tidings of both their sons, whom it had pleased God to take away. This giant who carried away the child was a native of Leonis, and he had two castles in an island, and his name was Gandalac. He was not so wicked as other giants, but of a gentle and good demeanor, except when he was enraged, and then would he do great cruelties. He sailed on till he came to the cape of an island, where there was a hermit. Now the giant had peopled that island with Christians, and ordered arms to be given him for his support. Friend said he, take this child, whom you must bring up for me, and teach him all that is convenient for a knight, for he is the son of a king and a queen, and I forbid you ever to be his enemy. The good man asked him why he had committed the great cruelty. That I will tell you, said he. I was about to embark to fight with Albadan, the fierce giant who slew my father, and has taken from me the rock Galtares, which is mine. But there came a damsel to me, and said, this which you want to do must be accomplished by the son of Perdion of Gaul, who will have more strength and activity than thou hast. I asked her if that was true. That shalt thou see, said she, 
when two branches of a tree shall be joined, which now are separated. In this manner Galeor was left with the hermit. While these things aforesaid passed, King Philangres reigned in Great Britain, who, dying without children, left a brother named Luzuate, of great goodness in arms and much discretion, who had married Brizena, daughter of the King of Denmark, and she was the fairest lady that was to be found in all the islands of the sea. So after the death of Falangres, the chief men of the land sent for Lisuate to be their king. End of chapters 3 and 4 of Book 1